Hello friends. This is Fanfic Universe. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto is placed at the forest of death with the power of Red Wolf? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. Minato Namikaze should have been a very happy man, he was one of, if not the, best shinobi in the elemental nations, he was the Yandaimi Hokage, he was married to the love of his life, Kashina Uzumaki, and, best of all, his firstborn son was going to come to the world at any moment now. However, he was not in a good mood at all. Why you ask? Because that blasted Kayubi no Kitsune had decided that now of all times it wanted to attack Konoha. Right now, he was at his office with his sensei, Jiraiya of the Sanin, and the previous Hokage. Here is an Serutobi, trying to come up with a way to stop it. And they had only found one such way. And neither Jiraiya nor Serutobi were happy with it. The Shiki Fujin. Minato ignored their pleas to let them do it. Not only it was his duty as Hokage, he was also the only one powerful enough to pull it off. He disappeared in a yellow flash, heading to the hospital. Serutobi and Jiraiya quickly sunshined there as well. When they arrived, they moved towards Kashina's room. When they arrived, they saw Kakashi, who had stayed there, sitting on the floor crying. Minato ran to his side. Kakashi, what happened? Are Kashina and Naruto all right? Minato sensei. Kashina, Kashina, Minato didn't wait for him to finish, but rushed into the room. He came back after a while, Naruto in his arms and Tsunade of the Sanin coming behind him. Jiraiya and Serutobi shivered when they saw Minato. He no longer was the Yandaimi Hokage that almost every person in Konoha loved and idolized. He was the Yellow Flash, the man whose mere name was enough to send enemy Shinobi running. And he was furious. Kayubi will pay for this, said Minato, his voice low and deadly, his chakra flaring around him. Then he disappeared in a Yellow Flash. Jiraiya and Serutobi ran top Tsunade. Tsunade, what happened? asked Serutobi. The birth was difficult. Even with all my skill, I would barely be able to keep her alive under normal conditions. With Kayubi's chakra and ki, killing intent. Affecting her though, said Tsunade, with tears falling from her eyes. They all wanted to take some time to mourn her, however, with Minato in the battlefield, facing the Kayubi, they didn't have that luxury. They shunshined after him. Minato arrived at the battlefield and grew even angrier than before, seeing Shinobi laying dead all around it. He bit his thumb, went through few quick hand signs, and slammed his hand to the ground. A huge cloud of smoke enveloped him, and when it cleared he was standing on top of a giant toad's head. Gamabunta, seeing the fox, instantly knew what was going to happen. You are going to use the seal, aren't you, Minato? asked the giant toad. I am, Gamabunta. It was good knowing you. Think you can hold it off long enough for me to finish? said Minato. I'll try. You better do it Gamabunta. Otherwise, we're all dead. Listen to me all of you. Retreat no. I'll take care of it. Shouted Minato to his shinobi, who were more than happy to obey. Kayubi looked surprised at the giant toad and the man on top of him who entered the battle. The toad was nothing special, but the man was another story. The fox was capable of sensing others' power, and this man could be an even match for Rokubi. Kayubi had never before encountered a man so powerful. From the sidelines, Kakashi, Jiraiya, Tsunade and Serutobi looked on as their friend and Hokage fought the Kayubi alongside with Gamabunta. They knew they would only burden him if they interfered. They watched as Minato started going through hand signs. They watched as Gamabunta tried to stall the fox, in the end almost losing his left eye at the fox's claws. They watched as Minato finished with the hand signs, whispered something to Naruto's ear, and then threw one of his special three-pronged kanais at the fox's head. Minato appeared on the fox's head in a yellow flash, just as the Shinigami finished with its preparations behind him. While the Shinigami's appearance was unexpected, Kayubi was sure that it would not be a problem. After all, whether or not the Shinigami managed to take the fox's soul depended on his summoner's strength. And while the human was powerful, he did not have enough power to match Kayubi. However, Kayubi hesitated for a second. The fox could sense the newborn the man held in his arms, and only that crazy tanuki, Ichibi, would kill a newborn. 
That single moment of hesitation was all the Shinigami needed to separate Kayubi's soul and body. Minato immediately did the seals required to seal the former inside Naruto. Just as the fox's body disappeared, Gamabunta caught Minato and Naruto with his tongue, gently lowering them to the ground. As this happened, Minato heard the Shinigami talking to him. You are very brave for a human. As a reward for this and for sacrificing so much to save your home, I'll not devour you. I'll let you move on. Just as Minato and Naruto touched the ground, Kakashi, Jiraiya, Serutobi and Tsunade appeared next to them. With his last strength, Minato placed one kiss on Naruto's forehead and gave him to Serutobi. Knowing that his life was closing to its end, he spoke to them. Listen to me my friends. Make sure that he is seen as a hero. If he is mistreated, I promise I'll come back and destroy Konoha myself. And, Serutobi, good luck with the paperwork. With one last laugh at the look on Serutobi's face and one last look at his son, Minato Namikaze, the Yandaimi Hokage, Konoha's yellow flash, left his last breath. His last thought was, I'm coming, Kashina. Some time later, Serutobi entered the council chamber, accompanied by Kakashi, who was carrying Naruto. Serutobi took his seat and looked at the council members. The shinobi side of the council, which consisted of the clan heads, were looking eager to get over with this meeting so that they could return to their houses and assess the damage done by the fox. The civilian members were bickering amongst themselves. Probably trying to find a way to profit from the situation. Heck, they probably don't care for all the shinobi lives lost today. Thought Serutobi disgusted. His thoughts were interrupted by the Hyuga clan head, Hiyashi. What is the purpose of this meeting, Sandame Sama? I'm sure we all have work to do. And where is Yandaimi Sama? Serutobi tried to think the most appropriate way to break the news to them, but as he opened his mouth to speak, he was interrupted yet again by a sound he didn't expect to hear giggling. A few moments back, when Kakashi entered the chamber, he sat down at the Hokage's right, between him and the youngest member of the council, the 19 year old head of the Inazuka clan, Sume. Sume looked curiously at the newborn sleeping in Kakashi's arm, as did the one year old sitting on her half dog, half wolf partner Kuromaru her daughter, Hannah. Before her mother could stop her, she sat up and, moving over to Naruto, softly stroke his cheek. This however was enough to wake the baby up. Naruto opened his eyes and looked at Hannah. For a moment, bright blue met deep brown, before Sume and Kuromaru walked over. I told you to stay close to me, Hannah. Sume scolded her daughter lightly. Then she turned to Naruto. Hello, pup. I'm Sume Inazuka. This is my daughter Hana and this is my partner Kuromaru," said Sume jokingly, knowing that there was no way that he understood her. Kuromaru approached the baby and started sniffing it. Kakashi looked a little uncomfortable at this. Everyone would be when a big half-wolf who could eat a baby in one bite was sniffing said baby. Naruto giggled and reached to grab Kuromaru's fur. Well, almost everyone. Sume smiled seeing this and picked Naruto up, placing him on Kuromaru's back. Naruto smiled at her and started laughing happily. Everyone smiled at this, finding it cute. Well, everyone except Konoha's resident icebergs, Danzo and Uchiha Fugaku. Serutobi started to believe that they wouldn't take the news as bad as he feared. Then Kuromaru spoke. May I ask something, Hokage-sama? Serutobi nodded and the half-wolf continued. Can you explain why the pup has two smells? Two smells? How does he smell? And don't start on why I didn't catch it, you know your nose is better than mine, asked Sume. Kuromaru chuckled and answered. Well, the first smell, which is completely his own, has a feral quality to it, even more potent than yours, Sume. The second smell, which is not his own, is that of a a fox, right? interrupted the Hokage. Kuromaru nodded in affirmative. Yes. How do you know this, Hokage sama? he asked. Serutobi sighed. Well, I won't find a better chance than this. He then proceeded to tell them all that had transpired, although he hid from them the fact that Naruto was Minato's son. As soon as he finished, the civilian side of the council started to shout, asking for the death of the boy, only to be silenced by a massive amount of ki from the shinobi in the room, the greatest amount coming from Serutobi, Kakashi, and, surprisingly, Sume. Danzo shot at Naruto a surprised look. All this killing intent in the room and he doesn't even flinch. 
Normal newborns would have started crying with one tenth of that amount. What's up with this kid? Sume snorted. Didn't you hear what Hokage sama told us? The pup felt the full force of the Kyubi's key. Do you honestly think that all our key combined is enough to match the foxes? Not a chance. Inside Naruto, a nine tailed fox heard this and smirked smugly. Interesting woman. Have to keep my eye on her. Back with the council, Danzo was making plans. I demand the boy be given to me for training so he can become a loyal weapon of Konoha. Denied, Danzo. I want Naruto to have as normal a life as possible, and to that end, all of you are forbidden from telling anyone that he has Kyubi sealed inside him. This is an sulfur monosulfide class secret. Revealing it will result in instant execution, said Serutobi, radiating key. Sume spoke next. Hokage sama, if that is your wish, why not let me adopt him? I'm the only one with a child near his age, so I'm the one most suited to take care of him. Plus, it seems that Hana and Kuromaru already took a liking to him. Moreover, if Kuromaru said that he smells feral, it might mean that he has a relation with my clan. And even if he isn't, my clan is the one better suited to teach him about it. Finally, if he is indeed Kashina's son, it's my duty to take care of him, she was my best friend after all. Sarutobi smiled. Unfortunately, Sume, I've already checked him and he has no detectable relation with anyone in this room, or any other living person in Konoha. His parents died in the attack. Don't ask who his father is, I've promised him not to reveal it to anyone but Naruto. Still, your other reasons are more than enough. You have my permission. Danzo interrupted however. Not so fast Serutobi. The brat is a civilian. The council must agree with this. Serutobi gritted his teeth. Danzo was, unfortunately, right. Very well Danzo, we will vote for it. Who agrees and who is doesn't with Sume Inazuka adopting Naruto Uzumaki? All the civilians and Danzo immediately said that they disagree, while Serutobi's teammates said that they didn't care. Serutobi sighed in relief. If all the shinobi agreed with the adoption, then there would be just enough votes for it to happen. Serutobi, who was both Hokage and head of the Serutobi clan and thus had two votes, spoke first. I agree with the adoption. Hitaki Kakashi, head and last surviving member of the Hitaki clan was next. I too agree with it, he said, I smiling at Sume. The Abarame head, Shibi, was next. Sume-san's arguments were perfectly logical. I agree with the adoption. Troublesome. I agree as well, said Shikaku Nara, lazily as always. His two teammates, Inoichi Yamanaka and Shoji Akamichi, each head of his respective clan, agreed with him. Needless to say, of course I agree, said Sume. The Hayuga head, Hiyashi thought this over for a while. While he didn't really care what would happen to the boy, Kashina had once saved his life during a mission. Seeing this as the chance to repay his debt, he too agreed. The only clan head who hadn't voted yet was the head of the Uchiha clan, Fugaku. Everyone turned to him, only to see him engaged in a whispered argument with his wife, Makoto, which ended when he slapped her. Now, this surprised everyone in the room for three reasons, one, because he did it in front of the entire council. Two, because the signs that Makoto was pregnant could be seen already, and even an idiot knew better than to hit a pregnant woman. And three, because Makoto, who was known as the second best Kunoichi of Konoha after Kashina Uzumaki, would let him. Fugaku turned to them smirking, ignoring the looks they sent him. I disagree with the adoption. Every shinobi in the room looked crestfallen at this, many glaring daggers at Fugaku, while the civilians were cheering. Serutobi sighed. Fine, Naruto will be placed in the orphanage. Kakashi, can you take him there please? This meeting is adjourned. Serutobi looked on as everyone filed out of the room. Damn it all, is that the best I can do? No, I'm the Hokage for Kami sama's sake. I'm the law in this village. It's time I reminded them of that. First thing in the morning, I'm taking Naruto to Sume, and the civilians and Danzo can themselves for all I care. And I must do something about Fugaku. Little did Serutobi know that he would regret his decision to wait till morning for years to come. A shadow approached Naruto's crib as he slept not making a single noise. It was dressed like an ANBU, but had a blank mask. The shadow took out a kanai and raised above the newborn's head. The member of Root, 
a group of Anbu loyal only to Danzo, was going to complete the order given to him by Danzo Sama and kill the demon child. However, despite his orders and his wish to follow them, he couldn't lower his arm. For some reason, he couldn't bring himself to harm the boy. Not understanding why that happened, and thinking that it was the work of the fox, he decided to do something different. He picked up the boy and sunshined out of there. Within a few minutes, he was inside Konoha's most dangerous place, the Forest of Death. Naruto, surprisingly, hadn't awakened. The root Enbu moved towards the center of the forest. When he reached it, he moved to the ground, intending to leave the boy there. When his feet touched the ground, he didn't see the three figures with golden eyes watching him, hidden in the forest's shadows and foliage. And when he put Naruto down and turned to leave, he didn't understand fast enough that the figures have jumped on him, teeth and claws ready to kill him. The last thing he saw as his life left him, was the things that attacked him moving towards Naruto. His last thought was, I completed my mission, Danzo Sama. The Sandame Hokage Hiruzen Serutobi was having a very bad day. He had lost many of his shinobi lately and he was now waiting for the people he summoned to arrive, so he could tell them what they were going to do. As he was waiting, Serutobi started to reminisce over what happened during the 17 years that had passed since the night Kayubi attacked. The very next morning, when Serutobi went to the orphanage to take Naruto to the Inazukas, he found out that he had mysteriously disappeared. He immediately had Inoichi Yamanaka check the mind of all the orphanage staff and council members to see who was responsible for this, but he found nothing. Of course, Serutobi was no fool. He knew that, since it obviously happened the same night of the attack, it had to be someone from the council, the only ones who knew about Naruto. Even to this day, Serutobi was sure that it was Donzo's doing, but he couldn't do anything without proof. What's more, ever since Serutobi disbanded the council and took all power back in his own hands, Danzo was very careful not to give Serutobi any reason to turn against him. Still, Serutobi knew that Naruto was still alive because the scroll that Minato had left for him had a special seal that would destroy it in case Naruto died. It was a precaution, so that nobody other than Naruto would get his hands on Naruto's inheritance. As long as the scroll was intact, Serutobi knew that Naruto was alive. Eleven years after that, Orochimaru's ex-apprentice, Anko Midarashi, was abducted by ten Konoha shinobi, six Janin and four Chunin who took her to the Forest of Death. When Serutobi and his Anbu found her in a clearing in the forest, she told them that they were about to rape her, when she heard a wolf howling, and she couldn't remember anything after that. Inoichi said that a very strong memory jutsu was placed on her, one that can only be broken by the one that did it, at least without causing to Anko irreversible brain damage. Serutobi understood the reason for it though, it was probably so that Anko wouldn't have a mental trauma from the sight, considering that the bigger intact piece that remained of her attackers was the small finger from one's foot. The clearing was literally painted red with the blood of those that attacked her. The fact that Anko couldn't remember who did this was probably a fortunate for him, her or them, whichever one it was side effect. Yeah, right. After that, Anko developed a very sadistic streak, distrust for almost all men, except Serutobi himself and her mentor Morino Ibiki, and started to spend much of her free time in the forest searching for the person or people who saved her, she never found anyone. Two years later, the entire Uchiha clan, with the exception of Uchiha Makoto and her son Uchiha Sasuke, was wiped out from Uchiha Itachi, who then became a missing nin. Serutobi was very sad this happened, but he couldn't let Itachi stay in the village. Still, a shinobi of such caliber labeled as a missing nin, yes, very sad indeed. Now, four years after that happened, a new crisis appeared. It all started six months ago, when some of his men, who were chasing a spy from Iwa entered the Forest of Death. The remains of them and the spy were found at the outskirts of the forest by Anko two days later. All shinobi he sent to find out what happened were also found dead. The only exceptions were the members of the Inazuka and Abarame clans, who had turned back after their respective companions refused to move beyond a certain point in the forest. And as every shinobi in Konoha knows, when an Inazuka's dog or an Abarame's bugs refuse to go somewhere or do something, the Inazuka or Abarame in question refuses to go there or do it, no matter what this, there, or, it, is. When asked why their partners didn't want to go on, they simply said that they were telling them that it was dangerous, that they were forbidden from continuing. They didn't say who was forbidding it though. 
The Inazuka and Abarame clan members said that they did try to warn their teammates not to continue, but they ignored them, often calling them cowards. When Enko was asked, she said that she had never been in that part of the forest because her snakes were telling her the same thing. What was even more surprising for Serutobi was that when he went alone with Kakashi, Enma and Pakun told them the same. So Serutobi called the best shinobi of Konoha in his office, so they could all go together. Serutobi was pulled out of his memories when he heard the door of his office opening and the shinobi he called coming in. He looked at them and started to call them by name, telling them the why they were chosen for this mission. The first person was a frightening sight indeed. He was wearing an awful green spandex suit, a jonin vest over it, had a bowl haircut and the biggest eyebrows ever seen in a human being. Made a guy, you are here because you are the best taijutsu user of Konoha, as well as one of the strongest and fastest jonin in the village. Next in line was a person wearing normal jonin clothes, but he also had a face mask on, which was covering the lower half of his face. He also wore his headband so that it covered his left eye. He had white gravity defying hair. Hitaki Kakashi, you are here because you are the best ninjutsu user in Konoha, not to mention Konoha's strongest shinobi after Jiraiya and myself. Next were the seven clan heads Inoichi Yamanaka, Nara Shikaku, Akamichi Shuha, Aburame Shibi, Hayuga Hiyashi, Inazuka Sume, and Uchiha Makoto. You are here because most of you have lost members of your family, plus, you are the strongest in your families. Sume and Shibi, we will need your abilities and see if your companions will refuse to go on even with all of us and if they can tell us anything about what we will be facing. Makoto, you are coming because of your ability and your Sharingan. Next was an Inazuka woman who looked a lot like Sume, but she had long straight brown hair, instead of short and wild. Hana Inazuka, you are coming because you are considered to be both the best tracker in your clan and a prodigy, since you have three companions instead of the normal one. Then was a woman in normal jonin clothes and a katana strapped on her back, she had long straight purple hair. Unknown to most in the room, she was an Anbu member. Azuki Yugo, you are the best Kenjutsu user in Konoha and the entire elemental nations with the exception of the Seven Swordsmen of Kiri. Your abilities in the other areas are also superb. Next to her was a beautiful woman with long black hair and entrancing red eyes. She wore a dress that looked to be made out of pieces of paper that were simply wrapped around her body. She also had a very generous figure. Yuhi Kuranai, you are the best genjutsu user in the elemental nations. Well, of those that don't have a kiki Jenke anyway. The last person was a woman with purple hair tied like a pineapple and wearing an open brown trench coat, with only a mesh shirt and a very short skirt underneath it. She was also wearing metal shin guards. If Kuranai was considered the most beautiful woman in Konoha, this one was considered the most why, and dangerous. Konoha's snake mistress herself, Midarashi Anko. Anko, you are here because you know the forest better than all the other inhabitants of Konoha put together and because we may have the chance to interrogate whoever is behind this. Serutobi paused for a second, then sighed and continued. I'll be honest with you Anko. There is another reason I want you to come. There is a great chance that whoever is behind this is the same person for I believe it's only one to be able to hide so well, which is even more scary if you think about it from six years ago. It's possible that you could go on alone and distract him or her with conversation about that time while we will surround him or her and strike when he, she least expects it. Anko looked at him dumbfounded for a second, before exploding. No way in hell I'm doing this you old fart. Everyone looked surprised at the way she talked to the Hokage while Serutobi himself started to leak key. I suggest you be careful how you talk to me, Jonan. I'm the Hokage and you will respect me. And you don't have a choice, this is an order. Anko felt her knees getting weaker under the pressure of the Hokage's key, but she managed to keep herself upright. I don't care if it's an order or not. This person saved me from a fate worse than death. I won't do this. To be honest, if it came to a fight, I would probably stand with him or her said Anko bravely. Serutobi's eyes narrowed hearing this, and they narrowed even more when he saw Kuranai, Hana and Yugo step forward and stand next to Anko. He should have known this would happen. These four were best friends after all. Then he gulped. The four women were giving him. The look, something all men in Konoha feared ever since they did something that only Tsunade herself had managed before them. They had made Jiraiya afraid to peep at them. Then he reminded himself that he was the Hokage and he was the one giving the orders. 
He tried to compromise. Will you agree if I promise you that we will take him or her alive? Anko and her three friends snorted. Why, so that you can interrogate him or her, have Inoichi pick his or her's mind apart and then kill him or her? Thanks, but no thanks. Sarutobi decided to weaken their front, so he turned to Sume. Can't you take control of your daughter, Sume san? Sume snorted. You seem to forget that my clan values above all else loyalty, Sarutobi. From what I see, Anko is being loyal towards the man who saved her from a terrible fate, and Hana, Kuranai and Yugo are loyal to their friend. I don't see anything I wouldn't do myself. Or something I won't do now actually, since my loyalty to my daughter is greater than my loyalty to the village when she is right. And with that she moved next to the four younger women, her friend and former teammate Makoto close behind. Sarutobi sighed and knew he had lost this fight, fine. I promise you that we will all approach him or her together and, provided there was a good reason for what he or she did, will try to persuade him or her to join Konoha. If there is no good reason however, he paused and released so much ki that everyone in the room fell to their knees, we will kill him or her. I give you permission to not join the fight, if you wish, but if you stand against us I will consider it an act of high treason and act accordingly. Am I understood? Everyone nodded in affirmative. The Hokage stood up and removed his cage clothes, revealing that he wore his old battle armor. Let's go. Thirty minutes later, they were near the section of the forest where all animal partners refused to enter. At the Hokage's signal they stopped and he told them to summon their companions. Kakashi summoned Pakum, Serutobi summoned Enma and Anko summoned a dirty green cobra at half the size of a full-grown man, which was named Calypso. Soon, Hana and Shibi approached them and the six of them, along with their animal companions lead the rest deeper into the forest. Suddenly, all the animals moved in front of their companions and stopped them. Enma spoke for all of them. We warn you, unlike the previous times, we are allowed to continue, but be respectful towards the one that we will meet. The sense of danger is still here. I don't think it would be wise to anger him. But who or what is this person, Enma? How is he in position to allow or forbid you from moving forward, when he is not even here? Asked Sarutobi. Enma shook his head. He doesn't need to be here. You guys, even the Inazukas, are humans and thus not as attuned to nature as we are. I guess you can call it animal instinct. Suffice it to say, there is no animal, summon or not, not even that bastard Manda that would act against him. I guess you could call him the king of this forest. If it comes to a fight, I suggest you guys send us away first, or else we will side with him. Not because we really want to, but because our instinct will tell us to. And trust me, if we can, feel him I guess you could say from here, there is no way we would be able to fight our instincts when we actually stand in front of him, unless he wants us to. And I doubt he will. Serutobi frowned at this information. If it was true however, it was all the better that all Inazukas and Abarames turned back when they did. Maybe he should send them back now as well. However this idea was shot down when soon, Hana and Shibi told him that their companions now actually refused to go back. Talk about a crazy situation. Serutobi sighed, cursed in his head, and turned again to Enma. So, I guess he knows we are here. Probably from the second you first set foot in the forest, answered the boss of the monkey summons. Serutobi sighed again, but he decided that they should continue anyway. It didn't matter even if that person called all the animals of the forest to fight by his side, they wouldn't be able to help him against Shinobi. All it would take would be a good Kaden Jutsu, and that was that. How the hell did Enma knew that it was a man anyway? After a while, he decided to ask. Hey Enma, how do you know that he is a man? It feels that way, that, and there were faint traces of his smell that told me that. I have never smelled his scent before though, answered Enma. Kuromaru interrupted them, I have, now that we are closer I'm sure that I have smelled this scent before, but I can't remember who it belongs to. For this to happen, it means either that I have smelled it years ago, or that I have smelled it only once before. Maybe both, more importantly, be on you guard. This territory is marked, we are in the hunting grounds of a wolf pack, if we meet it, you will have to fight, and before you ask, we will not help you. No Inazuka would ever attack a wolf, unless the wolf attacked first. And wolves never attack us. We are kin. Hearing this, 
Soom and Hannah smelled around worriedly, before looking at each other and nodding. He is right. The sooner we get out of here, the better. Let's move it, said Soom. The others nodded and picked up the pace. Soon enough, they reached a clearing. They looked around and were going to move when. Stop. You are not allowed to move any further, said a voice. Everyone looked towards their voice, only to go slack-jawed at what they saw. Bigger than even Kuromaru, gold-silted eyes and thick bright red fur, a wolf was talking to them. Hiyashi quickly got a kanai out and was about to throw it, when his hand was caught by Soom. Don't even think about it. I will kill you myself if you do it. Red wolves are sacred to our clan. They are considered more important than even our own partners, she growled. What do you mean by that, Soom? I thought that there was nothing more important than your partners in your clan. Just how important are they to you? And why? Asked Sarutobi, not taking his eyes away from the large canine. It was Hannah who answered. Let me put it this way. There is a story in our clan about a family member who once got in a fight with enemy shinobi near the hunting grounds of a pack with a red wolf. The red wolf came to help him and his partner in the fight. They won but both the wolf and the Inazuka's partner were severely injured. The Inazuka had enough time and supplies to save only one of the two. He chose to save his partner, letting the wolf die. As soon as his partner was healed, the dog attacked and killed the Inazuka for not saving the wolf. She paused to take a breath and continued. As for the reason they are so important to us, there are actually two of them. The first is because of what they actually are. The birth of a red wolf is a very rare occurrence. Red wolves are far stronger than normal wolves. They even can use chakra and even the weakest of them is said to be able to kill a low to mid-level jonin. For this reason, they always decide on their own to be the protectors of their pack, separating themselves from it. They watch their pack from afar, always on watch for any sort of danger. We respect them because they choose to live a lonely life in order to protect their pack. As for the second reason, According to our clan legends, we learned our clan techniques by a red wolf. It's good to see that the Inazuka have not forgotten us, said a different voice, a human male voice, coming from amongst the trees. Everyone looked at the direction the voice came from and saw a man, tall as Kakashi, wearing green and brown clothes. They could see that he had claws at the end of his fingers, but they couldn't see his face because it was hidden in the shadows. Kuromaru's eyes widened as he at last remembered the smell and recognized the person standing in front of them. However, he couldn't say it. It was as if something was holding his mouth shut. He soon realized that it was because of the man. His presence is completely overwhelming. He truly is the king of this forest. I feel like should get his permission to simply breath. Damn it, the humans are really lucky not being as sensitive to such things as we are. Who are you? Are you the one that has been killing my shinobi? asked Sarutobi. The other laughed. Who am I? I'm the red wolf protecting the wolves of this forest. Nothing more, nothing less. And yes, I'm the one that killed your shinobi. It's their fault really. I warned them to turn back, but they wouldn't listen and attack me. So, I killed them. Soon looked at him surprised. You are the red wolf. But, but what about him? She asked, pointing at the wolf. I'm simply his partner. He is indeed the red wolf of our pack, and the strongest of us. To us, it doesn't matter if he is human or wolf. He is a member of our pack, and he chose to walk this path. And for your information, Inazuka-san, he can use the techniques your clan uses in such a way that would make you look like simple children pretending to be shinobi in comparison, replied the canine. The man spoke again then. Now, you will probably wonder why I allowed you to come this time. Simply, because I remember your smells from all these years ago, and I want to ask you a question Sarutobi. And if you lie to me or if I don't like your answer, most of you will die. Only the Inazukas and Anko will leave alive. Though it's a pity for some of you. Some of you have really nice smells. Now for the question. He was interrupted by Anko, who shouted to him. Wait, are you the person that saved me all these years ago? He looked at her. Yes, it was me, Anko-san. There is nothing that I hate more than rapists. Well, could you please spare my friends as well? Otherwise I will have to fight you, even if I don't want to. If you don't attack us, we won't attack you, she asked. He shrugged. I don't really care. 
The only one that will definitely die if the wrong answer is given is Serutobi and anyone who tries to protect him. Now then. He extended his right arm and everyone saw that he had a storage seal painted on his palm. In a burst of smoke, an Anbu mask appeared in his hand. He threw it to Serutobi. What is this? Serutobi looked surprised at the blank Anbu mask and instantly recognized it. Where did you find this? This is the mask of a root Anbu. I thought they were disbanded years ago. Where I found it doesn't matter now. What's different between a root Anbu and a normal Anbu? Actually, that, I don't care. Just tell me if they are following your orders or not, said the man. No, they are not. They only ones they obey are Danzo. I ordered him to disband them years ago, because most of them were abducted as children and were stripped of all feelings and brainwashed so they would be loyal only to Danzo, answered Serutobi. The other side, you are telling the truth. I guess that means that I won't kill you after all. You can leave now, and don't send any other shinobi after me. Oh, and it was good to see you again, Kakashi, Soom, Hana, Kuromaru. He turned to leave, when Serutobi shouted to him. Wait, just who the hell are you? And how do you know me and the others? The man stopped and turned around. So, you still haven't guessed. You really are getting old. He started to come out to the light. When they saw his face, everyone gasped. He looked like an exact copy of the Yandaimi, the only difference is being that he had a lot of red in his hair and that his eyes were gold and silted. The eyes of a wolf. Then he brought his hand up and used his claws to rip his shirt in two, showing his abdomen. The younger women blushed at seeing his muscles, but the clan heads, Kakashi and Serutobi nearly fainted at seeing the all too familiar seal. N. Naruto asked Serutobi. The now-revealed Naruto nodded in affirmative, and then motioned to his wolf partner to come by his side. Yep, and this is my brother, Nawaki, nephew of Fenrir, boss of the wolf summons. But, how did this happen? You disappeared seventeen years ago, the very day you were born, and we couldn't find you anywhere. Naruto sighed. This mask comes from the man who brought me here and left me to die. The wolves that killed him kept it. They were led by Seto, Nawaki's father and Fenrir's cousin. I was raised by them. And the wolves now this forest better than anyone, save myself. It's not strange they could hide from your shinobi. I see. Well, at least this gives me the proof I need to take care of Danzo. But tell me, how can you possibly remember us? You were one day old for Kami-sama's sake, said Serutobi. Naruto smiled a mischievous smile that resembled not a wolf, but a fox. You of all people should know Serutobi that there was someone who could remember and showed me the memory later. I'm never alone after all. Serutobi paled. You, you know about. Kayubi. Yes, I know about Kayubi. For years actually, it was Kayubi that taught me how to talk, it was Kayubi that taught me about chakra and how to use it. It was Kayubi that taught me many jutsu that she had learned and seen used during her life, it was Kayubi that told me who I am and made sure that I would remain somewhat human, and not simply be a wolf with a human body. And finally, Kayubi is the reason that the wolves saved me and accepted me in their pack, by awakening my Keke Genke the moment she entered my body. Wait, wait, wait. She, Keke Genke, said Serutobi, more than a little surprised. Yes, Serutobi, she. Why is that a surprise? Don't tell me that you find it hard to believe, said Naruto mockingly. Serutobi felt the key coming from the women around him and wisely stayed quiet. But, Naruto, you can't trust the fox. It may as well have done all these so that you would let it out so it can kill us all, said Kakashi. The next second, the clearing was flooded by an unreal level of key, all of which was directed at Kakashi, who was at his knees and trying to keep himself from having a heart attack. I already told you that Kayubi is a she, so you shouldn't refer to her as, it. And for you information, I offered her once to release her, but she denied because it would kill me. So I suggest you shut the up, said a royally pissed of Naruto. Kakashi nodded in affirmative, too scared to talk, and soon Naruto calmed down. Anyway Naruto, you have to come with us back to Konoha. It is where you belong. Your parents would want you to become a shinobi of Konoha. Naruto looked at him. You are wrong, Serutobi. This is where I belong. Still, maybe I will come, if you agree at some terms. 
Before Sarutobi could open his mouth, Soom beat him to it. What are these terms, Naruto-sama? Just call me Naruto, I don't like honorifics. As for who they are, he suddenly stopped and sniffed the air. He turned to Nawaki, make sure they stay here. I have something to take care of. With that, he ran off with amazing speed. What just happened? Asked Hiyashi. Someone entered the forest and is heading towards the place the cubs are. Whoever they are, they are dead. He never lets anyone outside the pack know where they are. Unlike the ones you sent, they won't even receive a warning, much like the first ones he killed six months ago, answered the wolf. Now that you mentioned it, why did he kill them? They were simply chasing a spy. They didn't threaten him or his pack, said Sarutobi. Oh, really? What do you think throwing around jutsus indiscriminately, especially fire jutsus is called? Growled Nawaki. Enko then thought of something and turned to Soom. Naruto-sama, where did that came from? She asked teasingly. Soom shrugged. I already told you that red wolves are sacred to our clan. In our clan's hierarchy, him being a red wolf puts him higher than me and the Hokage together. Sarutobi slapped himself. I am an idiot. He said that Kayubi activated a Keke Genke, but I didn't ask him about it. As far as I know, neither Minato nor Kashina had one. Perhaps I can answer that, said Nawaki. Everyone turned towards him. What do you know about his father's ancestry? Asked the wolf. Nothing, I'm afraid. He was an orphan when he was young. He never met any relatives of his, even if there were some still alive somewhere, answered Sarutobi. You were wrong about that one. He and Naruto are actually very distant relatives of the Inazukas. They originate from the same clan, said the wolf. Soom and Hana went bug-eyed at this. Wait, you can't possibly mean that he is a direct descendant of that clan, said Soom. Nawaki nodded. That's exactly what I mean. He is the last descendant of the main branch of the Okami clan. As you probably know, this clan was much like you are now, only they were partnered with wolves instead of dogs. So were the side branch family, but they were weaker. Now, at some point in history, something happened. Even Fenrir, who was alive back then, is not sure exactly what happened, but it probably was some sort of virus. It caused mutations to both branches of the clan, but it was much more serious to the main branch. Nobody died, but the main branch lost all connection with the wolves. They couldn't even understand us any longer. The side branch members were luckier. They lost their connection with the wolves, but they earned a connection with the dogs. They were the first in Azukas. The red wolf who was protecting all members of the Okami clan, decided to teach them the moves you use even now, before he left with the rest of the wolves. When Kayubi sama entered Naruto, she caused a controlled mutation herself, thus activating the connection. Actually, according to the laws of the Okami clan, since he bonded with a red wolf, that would be enough to make him clan head once he finished his shinobi training. This is the first time it has ever happened. He stopped and sniffed the air. He's returning, and he's pissed off for some reason. Soon, Naruto jumped in the clearing, and everyone saw that Nawaki was right. He was pissed off. What happened, Naruto? Are the cubs all right? Asked Nawaki. Yes, they are all right. These bastards, they were hunters that came to get wolf pelts specifically. They had even hired some shinobi for help, said Naruto, seething. What did you do to them? Asked Hana, who was also seeing red. Let's just say that the pack won't need to hunt today, answered Naruto. He took a few deep breaths to calm himself, then spoke. Now, before we were interrupted, I think I was about to tell you my terms, correct? They are simple really. First, I want to deal with that Danzo guy myself, any way I see fit. 2. I will be given my inheritance. And 3. Nobody will enter this section of the forest without my permission. If anyone from Konoha harms a wolf from my pack, I will find the one that did it and kill his or her's entire family in front of him or her, before I kill him or her. And there will be no consequences about it. Do you agree? Sarutobi thought about for a while, before agreeing. It seemed fair enough. He would just have to make sure to forbid anyone from hunting wolves, and to warn the Dayamo's wife not to wear any wolf pelts when she visits Konoha. Naruto nodded. Good. Wait here while I go gather some things. With that he left. 
Naoki turned to the humans in front of him. Let me tell you some things that you will do well to remember. 1. I hope your village doesn't agree with practices such as raping enemy shinobi, because if it does, it won't stand for long. 2. Never suggest that he is lying. He hates lies and he never tells them. 3. Make sure never to say the name Inari in front of him. It's taboo with him. They suddenly heard a tree falling. See what I mean? After a few minutes Naruto returned. All the women blushed when they saw him. He was dressed completely in red. Red trousers, red shirt and a red trench coat. The trench coat had the image of a nine-tailed fox at the lower part in a much darker red, so that it would stand out. In the middle, it had the kanji for red wolf. At the bottom, where Minato's cloak had the flames, there were several symbols. The full moon, the sun, a tree, a white feather, a black feather, a cloud with a thunder coming from it and a skull. He also had a straight sword strapped on his back. The guard and handle were shaped like a bird, though it didn't look like any bird they knew. The sheath had flames illustrated in all its length. The strange thing however was that the guard and the sheath were tied together with a strip of cloth that was painted blood red and had on it the same symbols as his coat. It was tied in a way that it would be impossible to draw the sword without untying it first. Naruto, where did you find these things? Asked Kakashi. The clothes are a gift from the only person I ever allowed to live with my pack for some time. The only human friend I have. Bet you can't guess who it is, as for the sword, that I won't tell you, so don't bother asking me. Anyway, let's get going, he answered. Everybody nodded and they set off in the favorite method of shinobi, jumping from tree to tree. Pretty soon they reached Konoha. Serutobi immediately brought everyone to his office. Well, first things first. Naruto, your inheritance. He went to the portrait of the Yandaimi and smeared some blood on it. It opened revealing a safe behind it. Serutobi opened it and removed a scroll, which he gave to Naruto, who sealed it in the storage seal in his hand, saying that he would open it when he was alone. Serutobi then turned to the rest of them. All right listen everyone, I want all of you to gather at training ground 7 tomorrow morning so we can test Naruto's abilities and determine his rank. Provided he wants to be a shinobi of course. He turned to Naruto, who nodded. Of course I want to. I need some action in my life. But first there are some things I want to say. First of all, who exactly in the village knows about Kayubi being sealed inside me? Originally, I told everyone rank Chunin and up because they all had a standing order to look for you wherever they went, so I told them. Unfortunately, some believed that you were simply the Kayubi incarnated, and they were glad you were missing. They even told about you to the civilians. Almost all of them hate Kayubi with a passion and are too blinded by it to see reason. Once word gets around that you returned, they will probably try to attack you, answered Serutobi. Naruto shrugged. First of all, I'm not going to hide that I have Kayubi inside me. I'm proud of it. Now, if anyone decides to attack me because of it, well there will be a few less idiots going around the village. Serutobi nodded. If they attacked him first, he had the right to act in self-defense. Very well, is there anything else you wanted to say? Yeah, about that test you spoke off, I want to fight everyone in this room. However, since I want to fight only with my own power, I will fight them one by one. Also, about the rank, officially I want to be a genin. And officially, just send me to any missions that need doing, either alone or with others, I don't care. The more dangerous the better. Provided you are satisfied with my ability of course, answered Naruto. Serutobi thought this over for a while. He didn't really like the idea of sending Naruto to danger, but he was obviously strong. Plus, he could probably use Kayubi's power to a certain extent. And if he managed to learn his father's jutsus, alright Naruto, I agree. Anything else? Yes, two more things. The only ones that will be at this test will be the ones in this room and they will be the only ones that will know my real rank and abilities. They must keep it secret from everyone, students, family, lovers, everyone. If anyone doesn't agree, he or she better leave now, said Naruto. Everyone thought about it for a while, but everyone eventually agreed. Good, now, I want to talk to you about Kayubi, so that we will avoid events like that with Kakashi happening again. It will be a long talk, so why don't everyone take a seat? Just remember, 
Nothing of what you will hear goes out of this room. Everybody nodded and sat down. Naruto took a deep breath and started. First of all, keep all questions until after I have finished. I'll begin by explaining some things about Kyubi's character. Kyubi is a demon all right, and that means that she likes fighting, killing, bloodshed, etc., etc. However, that is also true for many humans as well. In fact, unlike some humans, she wouldn't go around killing people just for the fun of it. She can be very friendly and likable when she is in a good mood. And she no longer wants to destroy this village, so don't worry. The reason she attacked was because she was attacked first by a man who attacked her first and tried to control her. A man who as far as she knew was loyal to Konoha, seeing that he helped build it. Uchiha Madara. Now, before you say that's impossible, let me tell you a few things about the Sharingan. You see, the Sharingan was given to the Uchihas by Kayubi herself, so it couldn't control her. Anyway, the Sharingan has three stages. The normal three Tomo form, the Mangekyo Sharingan, which is different for every person, and the eternal Mangekyo Sharingan. An Uchiha can obtain the Mangekyo by killing his best friend and the eternal Mangekyo only if he has a brother and both have the Mangekyo. Ha has to take his brother's eyes and implant them in his own. The eternal Mangekyo has the same techniques as the normal Mangekyo, with two differences. One its use doesn't drive the user slowly blind, as the simple Mangekyo does. And two, it allows the user to transfer his soul and his eyes to the body of another Uchiha whenever he dies. That's how he is still alive. He stopped, unsealed a bottle of water from his hand, drank Soma, and continued. Now, Kayubi didn't know that Madara had left Konoha decades before, and she took this as an attempt of Konoha to attack her. So she retaliated, although she wasn't really serious when she did. She was using only two of her tails. And if it wasn't for the fact that even demons wouldn't kill a newborn in cold blood, unlike some humans, she would simply have blasted the Yandaimi off. The seal he used summons the Shinigami to take the soul of the victim, however Shinigami doesn't use his own power. The seal pits the power of the user against the power of the victim. Now, my father was strong, there is no doubt about it. Kayubi once told me that he had power to take on the Rokubi. However Kayubi is far more powerful than that. If it wasn't for the fact that she hesitated because she didn't want to kill me, Konoha wouldn't exist now. He paused, and Sarutobi decided to ask one of the many questions going around his head. Wait. You said that Kayubi used only two tails of her power, but that Minato had enough power to take on the Rokubi, which means six tails. How could she overpower him then? Naruto started to laugh. Ha ha ha. Tell me, what do you think the difference in power between the Biju are? He asked. Well, with Aikibi as the base, Nibi is two times stronger than him, Sanbi three times stronger etc, etc, said Serutobi. Naruto shook his head. You are wrong, let me explain. Nibi is indeed twice as powerful as Aikibi. Sanbi however is three times stronger than Nibi. Yanbi is four times stronger than Sanbi. Gobi is five times stronger than Yanbi. Rokubi is six times stronger than Gobi. Nanabi is seven times stronger than Rokubi. Hachibi is eight times stronger than Nanabi. And Kayubi is nine times stronger than Hachibi. In short, Every single tail of a biju has equal power with all the tails of the previous one combined. To say it in numbers, if the power of Aikibi was 1, the order would be 1, 2, 6, 24, 120, 720, 5040, 40320, 362880. Aikibi, Nibi, Sanbi, Yanbi, Gobi, Rokubi, Nanabi, Hachibi and Kayubi respectively. Do you see now how massive the differences in power are? To put it simply, each biju can take on all the previous ones and beat them to the ground with ease. Unfortunately, this difference in power doesn't transfer to their human hosts when they are sealed. The human body can't stand such levels of power. When a host uses his or hers biju's power and he or she gains tails of power, these tails have equal power regardless which biju is sealed inside the host. Each of these tails is equal to power to Aikibis which means that only the hosts of Nibi and Aikibi can access the full power of their biju. And anyway, my father would be able to take on the Rokubi simply thanks to that strange jutsu of his that allowed him to move faster than even Kayubi's eyes could see. 
I wonder if he had left me instructions about it, he mused in the end. Sarutobi gulped at this piece of information and thanked all the gods that Kyubi no longer had a bone to pick with Konoha. Then he thought of something else. Madara had sought the destruction of Konoha for a long time. Does his eternal Mangekio mean that the only way to kill him is to kill all Uchiha's? Naruto nodded. The male ones, yes. However, if I could find the notes of a seal master and with Kyubi's aid I might be able to come up with a seal that would prevent him from doing so. I don't think I need to though. Madara is mine. I'm the only one that can kill him in a way that he won't be able to transfer to another body. And no. I won't explain how, not now. I don't reveal my secrets that easily. Well, as far as the notes of a seal master go, you won't have a problem finding them. Your father was the best seal user I've ever seen. Myself and Jiraiya of the Sanin are quite proficient in the art, but he was on a completely different level. I understand you want to keep some things secret, but I hope you will tell me sometime, said Sarutobi. Makoto spoke next. Naruto-san, I'm Uchiha Makoto. Please, I beg you try to create the seal you spoke about. I'm not about to stand by and watch my son killed without doing anything. Naruto nodded, he would do it anyway. He couldn't leave anything in chance when it came to that bastard. Anko then thought of something. Hey Gaki, in that scale of power you used before, where would you put yourself and the other hosts when going full out? Naruto thought about it, I'm not sure about their own power. So let's just say that they are Jonin level and that they can fully control the power of their biju. That would put the Aikibi and Nanabi hosts a little above the respective biju in power. The hosts of Sanbi, Yanbi and Gobi would be between Nibi and Sanbi. The host of Rokubi would be a little above Sanbi. The hosts of Nanabi and Hachibi would be between Sanbi and Yanbi, more towards Sanbi. As for myself, that's a complicated question. Because of my own nature, I can't fully control Kyubi's power, despite my own will and her cooperation. I can control up to four tails of power. At five I go completely feral, and at six I go berserk, which is better than going feral in my book. But why? Going berserk would mean that you would kill everything that moved, while going feral means that, oh, said Soom. Naruto nodded, exactly, it means that I would do whatever my instincts told me to and that means I would probably do things worse than killing people. It almost happened once, and that day I promised myself to never let it happen again. He turned to Anko, it was when I saved you from these bastards some years ago, when I became so mad I lost all control of myself and entered my five tails state. It took all my strength of will to revert back to normal before I did something I would regret. That was part of the reason I erased your memory. I didn't want anyone to remember me at my worst. And I still don't so don't ask me to undo it. You would only get nightmares anyway. Anko wanted to protest, but she knew he was right. Naruto sighed and continued what he was telling before. Anyway, I'm pretty strong myself, so with four tails I would say I'm a little stronger than the Rokubi host. There are too many variables to explain my other levels, so I will just say what would happen if I went all out. If I do, something that has never actually happened in battle before and only did it once to see how powerful I was, I had equal power with Kyubi when she is using eight of her tails. Everyone looked at him with wide eyes. Didn't he tell them a couple of minutes ago that no human could stand such power? How the hell was that possible? Naruto saw their expressions and sighed. Don't bother asking how this is possible, I won't answer. Just know that it doesn't depend solely on me. And I didn't finish. If I was willing to die, I could use a jutsu I created that could actually beat Kyubi. I would die from chakra exhaustion afterwards though. Their eyes somehow got even wider. Would you mind telling us about that jutsu, Naruto? Asked Sarutobi, who had at least found his voice. Naruto shook his head. All I will say is this. It has two states. The first one is powerful enough to take out an entire army and can put me in a coma from chakra exhaustion for several days, depending on how long I used it. The second state one is a wide area jutsu that can destroy an entire country. And the smaller the area gets, the more destruction it causes. I can bring it to a size equal to this building, which is smaller than Kyubi. If I used it against her, I would surround her with it. It would be destructive enough to beat her, maybe even kill her. Heck, if I ever manage to reduce it to the size of a human, 
it would probably be powerful enough to seriously injure even a god, provided he would simply stand there and not interrupt it. After he waited some time for them to pick their jaws from the ground, he turned to Sarutobi. Could you call someone to show me where my home is? I need to rest for tomorrow, as do most people in here. Sarutobi nodded and rose from his chair. I will show you myself. The rest of you, go get some rest. And remember, nothing said in here leaves this room, if you value your lives. A few minutes later, Sarutobi, Naruto and Nawaki were moving through the dark and silent street of Konoha, each lost in his thoughts. After some time, they reached a huge wall, with an elaborate metal door in the middle. From the door, a huge property could be seen stretching as far as they could see. Naruto whistled, Sarutobi chuckled, I know, impressive, isn't it? It's also the best protected place in Konoha thanks to you father's seals. If anyone tries to enter without your permission, well Minato never actually told me what would happen. But I'm sure Danzo has lost a few of his route trying to get in. Do you see the seal in the middle? Spread some blood on it, and the door will open. See you tomorrow Naruto. Naruto nodded and bit his thumb, smearing some blood on the seal and the door indeed opened. Naruto and Nawaki walked through. The door closed behind them. They approached the house, which was actually a mansion. Naruto smeared some blood on the seal keeping door closed and entered his house for the first time in 17 years. He had to admit it was nice. He created a few cage bunchons and sent them to explore the house. After a while all of them dispelled, letting him know the layout of the place. Naruto moved to the library. He looked around for a while and had to admit Sarutobi was right. There were many books on seals, some of them handwritten. There were also scrolls with jutsus, scrolls with taijutsu and kenjutsu styles, books with information about the various countries and clans of the elemental nations, even some books on politics. With few words, it was a goldmine. Naruto made a single hand sign and said, Taju cage bunshin no jutsu, some dozens of cage bunshins appeared in front of him. Okay you know what to do. Start reading. Once you finish, dispel. No more than twenty every ten minutes. One of the clones raised his hand and asked him, what about dad's scroll, boss? Naruto shook his head, I will read it myself tomorrow. Now get to work. Naruto then went to the master suit. He opened the window and looked outside. Good, the moon will be visible from here. Pity it's now moon tonight. He turned to Nawaki, who was looking restless. I know, it's difficult sleeping under a roof after so many years of sleeping under the stars. I feel somewhat restricted myself. I saw a small forest outside. You can go sleep there if you want. What about you? Asked the large wolf. Naruto shook his head. I need to get used to it sooner or later. Well, at least the bed will probably be more comfortable than sleeping on the ground or on trees. Well, if that's the case, I'm staying too. We are brothers and partners after all. Said Nawaki, his voice daring Naruto to argue, but he simply laughed and nodded. He undressed and went to sleep. Tomorrow would probably be a long day. Naruto woke up with a yawn. He had to admit, while it took some time to get to sleep, it was the most comfortable and relaxed sleep of his life. He looked next to the bed and saw Nawaki sleeping with a relaxed face as well. Naruto got up and went to the bathroom to take a bath. A cold one. Once he was finished he looked himself on the mirror. His skin was perfect, without a single scar thanks to Kayubi despite the numerous injuries he had over the years. You look yummy, said a voice in his head, giggling. Naruto rolled his eyes, calm down, you horny vixen, I just woke up, you need to find a better hobby than looking at me, and the whole thing with the dreams is getting rather old by now, thought back Naruto. Maybe, but you're still reacting at them, teased the voice in his head, which was of course Kayubi. Maybe, but I'm not acting on them like I know you want me to. Enough of that, how serious do you think I should get today? replied Naruto. Kayubi sent him the mental equivalent of a shrug, serious enough to show them that you can kick their asses six ways from Sunday with ease, but not serious enough to let them guess how good you can really be. Just make an exception for that Hayuga, he seemed to have a stick way too far up his ass for his own good. I'm sure you know the best way to humiliate him. Are you going to look at your father's scroll now? Not now. It's almost time. 
It seems we relaxed too much and overslept. I must find a way to make sure it won't happen again. I can't afford to be careless. Not now, not ever, said Naruto. He moved to his brother, partner and kicked him awake. Rise and shine, sleepyhead. It's almost time for my test. Get your lazy ass up, or I will make you play guardian to the cubs for the next month. Nawaki was up and awake faster than you could blink. Damn it Naruto, there is no need to be cruel simply because I overslept. Then he saw Naruto laughing and understood that he was fooled, again. I will get you one of these days, he mumbled. Then he smirked. Did you sleep well? Had some nice dreams today too. Naruto threw him a pillow. Shut up and get your ass moving. I have work to do. Pass my test, learn my team and then see the scroll my father left me. After that, we will see then. After they left the mansion, they took the rooftops to avoid being seen. Soon enough, they reached training ground 7 and saw everyone assembled. They approached them. Good morning people, I'm a busy person, so let's get straight to business. Who is my first victim? Heir, I mean opponent. And please introduce yourselves as well. He said with a smile that reminded everyone of Anko a little bit too much for their comfort. Then he saw a man that wasn't with the others the previous day and narrowed his eyes. The man had a lazy look on his face though not as lazy as the Nara and was smoking a cigarette. Naruto also saw that he had two trench knives at his belt. Naruto turned to Sarutobi. Who is this? I thought we agreed on something yesterday. Is this how easily the Hokage breaks his word? Sarutobi winced at Naruto's tone. He hoped that he could defuse the situation before things went bad. This, Naruto, is my son, Asuma. He wasn't with us yesterday only because he was away in an a rank mission. I thought it would be unfair for him to be the only one of Konoha's elites not to know about this. So you told him everything? Asked Naruto, his eyes still narrowed. Sarutobi nodded. Naruto moved in front of Asuma and looked him in the eye, studying him. Asuma shivered. This was creepy. It reminded him when he was still a fresh Jonin and he was waiting for the Yondaimi to give him his first mission. Back then, the Yondaimi's eyes had the exact same look. The only difference was that these golden silted eyes were even more unnerving than the Yondaimi's cold blue ones. Asuma always wondered how this man's eyes could go from warm and friendly the first second, and cold and dangerous the next. So, you are an elite. We will see about that soon enough. And I don't like you. Asuma scratched the back of his head nervously. I'm sorry, Naruto-san, but I'm still tired from mission. I won't be able to spar with you today. And why don't you like me? First of all, I don't. Spar, I fight. Second I don't like you because, one, you look too lazy, and two, because you stink. Answered Naruto. Everyone laughed at this. Well, everyone except Shibi and Hiyashi that is. I told you these cancer sticks of yours would get you into trouble one day, Asuma, said Kuranai, laughing. Okay, now, once again, who's first? Asked Naruto, getting impatient. Kuranai stepped forward. I'm Kuranai Yuhi. I use mainly Genjutsu, so this is where I'll test you. So please don't use anything else. If you don't know any Genjutsu, I'll simply test how good you can break them. Naruto smiled at her. Kuranai Yuhi, eh? Your scent surely lives up to your name, Roses, first time I meet a person with such a scent. Then he got serious, I don't know many genjutsu, but the ones I do were taught to me by Kayubi, so they are rather frightening, and strong. So I suggest you use your best one from the beginning. Kurinai fought down a blush at his comment about her scent and nodded. They both started to go through hand signs. Surprisingly, they had exactly the same speed. It seemed Naruto's jutsu required fewer hand signs however, because he stopped first. Nothing happened however, and they understood that he was actually waiting for Kurinai to finish. Bad idea, he will lose if he lets her complete that jutsu. The only people who ever got out of that genjutsu were Kakashi and Makoto-san because they used the Sharingan, whispered Asuma to Gai, who nodded. Kurinai finished just then and spoke. You should have acted when you had the chance. Demonic Illusion. Tree Binding Death Jutsu. Naruto watched curiously as a tree sprouted behind him and its branches tried to catch him. Impressive, he muttered. Then he let loose a burst of chakra so big that it disrupted the genjutsu. He looked at Kurinai and spoke. 
Impressive indeed, but not enough. I have so much chakra that I can simply use the crudest method of disrupting genjutsu, that of expelling too much chakra, and not even feel the drain. Now it's my turn. He made one more hand sign and whispered. Illusion of hell. First level. The world around Kurinai suddenly changed. She was in a land of fire and brimstone. She saw skeletons moving around. She lifted her hands to dispel it, but other hands suddenly caught hers from behind. She looked back and saw that it was more skeletons. More hands erupted from the ground, catching her legs, immobilizing her. She tried to expel her chakra to dispel it, but nothing happened. The part of her mind that was not gripped in fear told her that Naruto had too much chakra to be overpowered that way. She saw more skeletons surrounding her. She felt panic closing in, when the illusion faded and she saw Naruto looking at her apologetically. I'm sorry, but this is the most benign genjutsu I know. Trust me, you don't want to know how the ninth level is. Kurinai calmed her racing heart and nodded. She got back with her friends who started to ask her what she saw, while Guy moved forward. Naruto's eye twitched when he saw him. He had hoped that he was hallucinating yesterday, when he saw him, but it seemed he was not so lucky. This guy is weird. Then Guy spoke. Yash, I'm made a guy, let's fight only with Taijutsu Naruto-kun and show everyone our flames of youth. Being weird, the guy is an outright freak. Please beat him fast Naruto-kun said Kayubi. Naruto nodded. If he didn't beat him fast, he would definitely have nightmares later. Guy got in his stance, while Naruto simply stood there and motioned for Guy to come. Guy looked surprised at this, but attacked anyway. Konoha Shenpu. He jumped to Naruto, twirling around himself and kicking him, adding the speed of the rotation to the strength of the kick. Naruto used both hands to block the attack, but was driven a couple of feet back because of the force of the attack. Guy landed to the ground and started throwing punches and kicks to Naruto with great speed, who managed to block all of them, if only barely. Meanwhile, the people watching from the sidelines were commenting. The kid is very good. His speed is almost equal to Guy's. It's not enough to beat him though. He will lose the way this is going, commented Yugao. Suddenly, the flow of the battle changed. Guy was no longer landing any hits on Naruto who was dodging all attacks, showing that he had great agility and flexibility. What the, did Naruto get faster? Was he hiding his true speed? Asked Hana. Sarutobi, who had a lot more experience, shook his head. No, it's not that Naruto got faster. If you observe carefully, you will see that his speed is still the same. The reason Guy can't hit him isn't because of speed. Naruto jumped backwards and spoke to Guy. You are strong and fast. I'll give you that. But there is no point in continuing. You have already lost. What are you talking about? You still have not attacked even once. And just because you were holding back your speed before doesn't mean that you can beat me now, said Guy. Naruto shook his head. You are wrong, Guy san. My speed hasn't changed. The reason you can no longer hit me is different. And why is that? asked Guy. Everyone else waiting to hear as well. Naruto chuckled. Simple. I have already seen through your taijutsu. You have lost. Guy scowled at Naruto and attacked him again, his movements a blur. Everybody watched as Naruto weaved through every single attack and threw a single punch, which hit Guy at the throat and forced him to fall back to regain his breath. Naruto didn't press his advantage, he simply repeated what he said before. Give up. You have lost. Instead of answering, Guy removed his weights and threw them to the side his weights creating big craters where they landed. I'm not done yet. Naruto scoffed at that. Do you think that by simply removing a little weight and raising your speed a bit you can beat me? Fool, don't make me say it again. You have lost. Guy didn't answer. He simply disappeared from his position and soon a trail of dust could be seen circling Naruto. It was Guy who was running around him. What a fool. He just proved Naruto right and lost all chance of beating him whispered Serutobi. Inoichi heard him and asked. What do you mean, Hokage-sama? Aside from yourself and people with a three-tomo Sharingan, there is not a single person in Konoha who can keep up with Gai-san's speed. Serutobi answered, shaking his head. Think about it Inoichi, he was able to see through Gai's taijutsu in a couple of minutes. The only advantage Gai still had was increasing his speed by removing his weights. 
he should have used it to attack him the moment he removed his weights. What he is doing now is exactly what Naruto needs. He is giving Naruto the chance to analyze his speed. Just watch. Naruto shook his head. This is useless. I already told you I can. He took a couple of steps back, leaned a little to the right, brought both his hands at the left side of his head, and caught Guy's hand. Read all your moves. He used his grip on Guy's hand to raise himself from the ground and deliver a double kick in Guy's face, breaking his nose and a couple of teeth. He then let Guy's hand go, fell to the ground hands first, did a handstand and kicked Guy with both legs, one in the gut and the other in the chest, throwing Guy to the air. He then used his hands to throw himself on the air behind Guy, he twisted in the air with unnatural agility and planted his right foot at the side of Guy's neck and used it to slam him to the ground. In a second he was above him, his claws ready to tear his throat out. You lose. Everyone looked wide-eyed at what just happened. It was the first time they saw someone without the Sharingan reading one's moves so perfectly. Naruto looked down at Guy. I've to admit one thing. You Taijutsu is. Yes, said Guy eagerly, thinking that he was about to be complimented. Complete and utter rubbish. Guy jumped up and looked at Naruto, not believing what he heard. What? Why are you saying this most unyouthful thing? Naruto's eyebrow twitched at hearing the why word, but answered anyway. Simple. You are strong and fast, but that's all that you have. You are too straightforward, and that makes your moves ridiculously easy to predict and avoid. You lack flexibility and fluidity. Simply throwing punches and kicks around isn't taijutsu. What you are doing is simply a somewhat more refined form of street brawling. Moreover, because I guess you always wear these weights to increase your speed when you remove them, once you do it's very difficult to stop a move once you begin it not only because of the speed itself, but also because you are not really used to it. Guy left the area of the fight, thinking about what he heard. Hannah went next. Seeing her, Naruto smiled. Why not call your mother as well? It will make things more interesting. Hannah nodded and motioned for her mother to come. After she did Naruto spoke to them. Okay, this is a battle only between the three of us. No partners. Of course, if you insist they can fight with you but in this case I'll have to call mine to deal with them. Kuromaru and Hana's partners, the Heimaru triplets, immediately left. Naruto smiled at that. Very well, let's begin. All three of them jumped backwards and crouched down. The appearance of all three of them changed slightly, taking a more feral look, their fingernails elongating to claws and their teeth sharpening. None of them moved for a while, but everyone could see that their muscles were tense. They really looked like hunters ready to pounce on their prey. Then they rushed towards one another, beginning the fight. Naruto attacked first, jumping towards Sum and sending a downward slash to her but she jumped back and avoided it. Hana retaliated by doing the same, with the same results. Sum rushed Naruto and they started to trade blows, or rather slashes with their claws. It was soon seen that Naruto was better, being the first whose attack connected, even if Sum pulled back at the last second which resulted in her shirt being cut near the waist. Hannah lunged to Naruto from behind in order to help her mother, but she growled and Naruto heard her. He kicked her in the gut, sending her backwards. Soon took advantage of his distraction and tackled him, sending both to the ground. They started to roll around, fighting for dominance. They even used their fangs to try and bite the other's throat. Eventually Soom got on top, but as she raised her hand to hit him, he growled and punched her in the gut, sending her backwards. He got back on his feet, just as Hana joined Soom. They started to circle each other. Suddenly Naruto smirked. Just as Hana and Soom were wondering why this happened, he raised both his hands, and then brought them down, shouting, Wind Claws. Five large blades of wind left each hand and headed towards Hana and Soom, who hurried to get out of the way. A wise decision, as the trees that were behind them were cut down. Everybody's eyes widened as they saw each wind blade go through three trees before dissipating. What the hell was that? asked Hana. Naruto smirked smugly, much like a fox. That was the technique known as elemental claws. It was a technique used by the Okami clan. It infuses the claws of the user with his or hers elemental affinity. You saw the result. What? Your clan can't use it. The next second Hana and Soom were in front of him giving him the puppy eyes, making everyone else sweat drop. 
No, but can you please teach it to us? Please. Naruto laughed. Sorry girls, but I've been given this look so many times from the cubs that I've developed immunity. He then looked at them seriously. Maybe I'll teach it to you if you get better. And I think we should continue the fight later. There are too many spectators for my liking. Soom and Hannah exchanged a look, nodded and left. When they joined the others, they were asked why they didn't continue the fight, but they refused to answer. It was Shibi who came to their help, much to everyone's surprise. Leave them alone. Even if they told you, you wouldn't understand. It has to do with how close their behavior is to their companions. And how do you know that, Shibi? Asked Sarutobi. Shibi readjusted his glasses and answered. Simple. Hokage-sama, with the exception of the Inazuka clan, my clan is the one that understands animals better than anyone else in Konoha. That's how I know. Sarutobi was about to answer, but he was interrupted by Hiyashi. It doesn't matter, I'll show that peasant what true taijutsu means. He said full of arrogance, as he moved towards Naruto. I'm Hiyashi Hayuga, prepare yourself to lose, kid, he told Naruto. Naruto simply lifted an eyebrow. You know, Kayubi asked me to humiliate you because she thinks that you have a stick way too much up your ass for her liking, and I agree with her. So it is you who should prepare yourself. You won't even manage to bruise me. Hiyashi growled again and attacked, sending a palm strike to Naruto's shoulder. Who didn't move and let it connect, which resulted in, nothing. Hiyashi looked at Naruto surprised, who simply started to laugh. Fool, your taijutsu is indeed strong but it has one glaring weakness. It is based in using your chakra to cause internal damage with your strikes, as well as closing the opponent's tenkensu. What happens however when your opponent has as good, if not better, control of his chakra as you? All I had to do was expel chakra from my tenkensu as your attack hit, thus not allowing your chakra to enter my system. Your attack, which would seriously injure someone else, was a simple tap to me. Hiyashi gritted his teeth. Oh yeah. Let me see if you'll find this a simple tap as well. 8 trigrams. 64 palms. Once again, Naruto didn't try to move, but instead received the hits. And once again he looked like they were mere insect bites. He wasn't even thrown back. Naruto shook his head at Hiyashi's shocked face. You were indeed a fool. Did you learn nothing from my fight with Gai San? I'm able to analyze the fighting style of my opponent within a couple of minutes. Now. In case you forgot, among the shinobi who came to find me in the forest, there were members of your clan. They all used the same style. The attack you tried before, it worked on me only once because I let it hit me so I could learn where exactly the tenkensu are. By knowing this, I'm able to do, this. With these words, he got into a juken stance, shocking everyone. Hiyashi however scoffed at that. Fool, you think you can use the juken without the Byakugan? That's impossible. With that, he got in a Jukan stance himself. Naruto smiled. Well, then why don't we find out? I have to say though, I love this. What greatest victory is there than to turn one's own knowledge, one's own weapons against him? And what greatest humiliation? Well, Hiyashi, ready for your humiliation. It will be you who will be humiliated. With these words, the two men launched themselves towards one another and engaged in fight. A fight that looked a lot like a dance. If the spectators didn't know better, they wouldn't believe that this could easily end in the death of one of the two combatants. It soon became obvious that Naruto not only could hold his own against Hiyashi, he was actually beating him thanks to his greater speed, agility and flexibility. While Hiyashi blocked and dodged Naruto's attacks, it looked like Naruto was dancing around Hiyashi's attacks. Eventually, Hiyashi jumped back to regain his breath. That was all the chance Naruto needed. He got in the same stance Hiyashi did before, when he used the 64 palms. Now, how did you say it before? Oh, yeah, 8 trigrams, 64 palms. 2 palms, Hiyashi was too shocked and didn't manage to avoid them. 4 palms, 2 more strikes. 8 palms, 4 more strikes. 16 palms, 8 more strikes. 32 palms. 16 more strikes, the last one sending him crashing on a tree. 64 palms, 32 more strikes, each one making him hit his back to the tree and the last one sending him through it. Naruto stood over the unconscious Hiyashi. 
Maybe this will teach you a lesson in humility, Hiyashi Hayuga. He picked up the man and threw him towards the spectators, where Guy caught him. The other shinobi looked at one another, discussing who should go next. They decided that Kakashi should be last, so that he could get more information on Naruto's abilities before he fought him. He was the strongest amongst them after all and had the better chance of succeeding. Eventually, Chuja went next. I'm Akamichi Chuja. Everything goes in this fight. Do your best. With these words, Chuja used his family jutsu becoming a giant. Naruto immediately went through several ideas to beat him in his mind, eventually choosing the easiest of them. Oh, I like the way you think, Naruto-kun. This is evil, said Kayubi in his mind. Well, I don't. This is too low, even for Shinobi. But it is the easiest way, as well as the one that will cause him the least injury. But I can't help feeling sorry for him. Naruto thought back. When Chuja unsealed a big staff and tried to hit him, Naruto avoided the attack and run between Chuja's legs. Before Chuja had the chance to do anything, Naruto went through a few hand seals. Every shinobi in the audience recognized them, and their eyes widened, not believing what he was about to do. Naruto finished the hand seals and slammed his hands to the ground and shouted, Doden, Earth Wall Jutsu. Immediately, a large earth wall rose up, and hit Chuja at the groin, cancelling his jutsu and making him go cross-eyed and go in a fetal position and whimper, trying to endure the pain. Everyone looked at Naruto, still not believing that he actually did that. Naruto just shrugged, what, he did say that everything was allowed, everyone face faulted at this. Now, who's next? asked Naruto, taking a too innocent expression. All males immediately took a step back. Anko stepped forward, cackling evilly. Well, since the men are too afraid, I guess I'll be next. And thanks for the wonderful idea, Naruto-kun. Not her too, thought Naruto. Hey, you have to introduce me to that girl sometime, Naruto-kun. She seems to be, promising, said Kayubi. Everyone was surprised at seeing Naruto taking a horrified expression and shouting. No way in hell I'm doing that. Naruto, what happened? asked Sarutobi, worried to see Naruto actually shivering from fright. Kayubi, she said, she said that she wants to meet Anko because, according to her, she holds a lot of promise, answered Naruto, still shivering. Suddenly, Anko had an expression like Christmas came early, while everyone else was trying to find a place to hide and hope to survive that. Anko started to advance on Naruto, cackling like a madman and rubbing her hands together. Well, Naruto-kun, how can I meet her? Naruto got in a battle position and extended his claws. Over my dead body, there's no way I'm allowing this. She smirked. Well, I'm sure I'll be able to change your opinion. She said, throwing some kanai at him. Naruto dodged them and rushed at her, planning to engage her in taijutsu, where he knew he had the advantage. This was not a fight he could afford to lose, if he was to keep his mental health. Kayubi alone was more than enough. He didn't need a mini-me of her going around. Anko actually fared quite well. Her taijutsu style relied in avoiding her opponent's attacks until she found an opening or weak spot, when she would strike, hard and fast. However, it soon became obvious that Naruto was out of her league. Not only he was faster, stronger and more agile than her, it was like he knew every move she was going to do before she did it. And, Unlike with his fight with Guy, he didn't even need a couple of minutes to do it. He was doing it from the beginning of the fight. Anko jumped back and cursed. How the hell are you doing this? Naruto smirked. You really can't guess. Did you forgot where you were training, Anko-san? Anko eyes widened when she realized what he meant. She always did all her training in the forest of death. But that meant, you were watching me when I was training. Why would you do that? She asked him pissed that he would do that. Naruto shrugged, simple, I was watching you for two reasons. One, so that in case someone tried to attack you, I could kill them. And two, in case you proved to be a danger to my pack, so I could kill you. Anko unconsciously shivered at that last part. She could tell that he was serious. Back to the fight, Anko decided that if she couldn't challenge him in taijutsu, she would turn to ninjutsu. Remembering that his affinity was wind, she formed a few quick hand signs and with a shout of, Kaden, Grand Fireball Jutsu, 
she sent a fireball at the size of a man at him. Seeing this, Naruto shook his head. Why does everyone make the same mistake? He wandered. He formed a few hand signs himself and, throwing his hands forward, he shouted, Futon, great breakthrough jutsu. A powerful gale of wind shot forward from his hands, heading with great speed towards the fireball. When the two met, the fireball became stronger, but it also changed direction, heading straight back to Anko. Anko cursed again and used a quick Kawamiri to get out of the way. She immediately threw some Kanai to Naruto, and when he dodged them he found himself in the path of some snakes coming from Anko's sleeves. And Naruto knew these were poisonous snakes. He immediately used his wind claw, the blades of wind severing Anko's snakes and forcing her to jump out of the way. What Anko didn't saw however, was that Naruto started doing hand signs the moment the blades of wind left his hands. Just as Anko was about to touch the ground, a new gale of wind hit her, sending her to crash with great force on a nearby tree, knocking her unconscious. Naruto sighed in relief, glad that this was over and then carried Anko to the side. When he put her down Sarutobi spoke to him. Naruto, after this test is over, I'll give you the payment for an A-rank mission for stopping her. I don't think that Konoha would survive if Anko became even more sadistic. Naruto nodded, although inwardly he was saying that he did it for himself, not Konoha. He looked at the people assembled around him, wondering about his next opponent. Hey, abarame san would you like to be next? Shibi shook his head, I'm sorry, Namikaze-san, but fighting you would mean that many of my bugs would die, even if I were to defeat you. I would rather avoid that. Naruto nodded, understanding where he was coming from. All right then, Nara-san, do you have any reason not to fight? Shikaku sighed, troublesome, fine, let's go. Name's Shikaku, by the way. As they got ready to begin, Naruto was thinking. This might be difficult. According to my father's records, the Nara clan consists of geniuses and they can control shadows. This means I have two ways to fight him. The easy one that requires me to show off and the easier one that doesn't require me to reveal anything. Well, that's an easy decision. Of course it is. Showing off it is. Interrupted Kayubi. Naruto resisted the urge to palm his face. Q, you do know that shinobi are supposed to hide their abilities, don't you? Kayubi sent him a mental pout. Spoil sport. First Anko and now this. Do you want to take away all my fun? Considering your idea of fun usually involves trouble for me, yeah, I do. Replied Naruto. Meanwhile, Shikaku decided to finish this quickly, so he threw a powerful flashbang directly behind him, which exploded releasing a powerful light, which made his shadow grow in front of him. This way, Naruto wouldn't be able to escape his shadow. Unfortunately for Shikaku, when Naruto saw the flash bang, he immediately unsealed one from his hand and threw it between them. That meant that now there were no shadows at all around Shikaku, not even his own. Naruto shot forward, following his nose, very glad that his father had many shinobi tools stashed in his house. Within seconds, he was next to Shikaku, holding a kanai to his neck. So, so you give up, Nara-san. Not yet I'm afraid, Namikaze-san, said Shikaku calmly. Naruto wondered why that was, but immediately found out that he couldn't move. He opened his eyes and saw that the light was gone and there were shadow hands going up his body. He looked at Shikaku questioningly, who explained, while it was a good idea to use another flash bang to counter mine you probably didn't know that they last for a few seconds. And now I'm afraid that it's you who have lost, Namikaze-san. The shadow hand's jutsu gets stronger the closer the user is to the victim. If Naruto could move his hands, he would slap himself. He looked at Shikaku calmly, and replied with the same words Shikaku used before. Not yet I'm afraid, Nara-san. It seems you'll have your fun, Q. Shikaku wondered what he meant but then he saw that the shadow hands that were close to Naruto's neck weren't moving upwards anymore. Instead, they were actually moving downwards. Shikaku looked at Naruto's calm eyes. He's using his own chakra to push the hands back. He doesn't even look like he's trying, and yet I can't make the hands resume moving upwards, no matter how hard I try. I'll lose the way this is going, and I can't move without breaking the jutsu. I trapped myself. Still, he fought six battles in a row, and he doesn't look like he broke a sweat. 
How much power does this kid have? Eventually, the jutsu broke. So, Nara-san, do you have any other tricks up your sleeve? Asked Naruto. Shikaku sighed. No, I don't. This is your win, Namikaze-san. Naruto nodded and removed the kunai from Shikaku's neck, who rejoined the audience. The only people left to fight Naruto were Inoichi, Yugao, Makoto and Kakashi. Everybody knew that Inoichi's abilities weren't meant for one-on-one -on -one battles, so he was out. They decided to go by order of power and ability, so Yugao went first, drawing her katana. I'm Yugao Azuki. I'll test you in Kenjutsu. Draw your sword and get ready. Naruto scowled at this. Listen to me girl, and listen me well. First of all, never challenge me in a Kenjutsu fight, because in these fights I always aim to kill, and I don't think you want to die yet. Second, if you were truly worthy of holding a sword, you would know just by seeing me that I'm beyond your ability. And for your information, I'm better at Kenjutsu than Taijutsu. And third, pray to all the gods that I will never have to draw this sword. While Yugao wondered what he meant by that last one, she decided to reconsider her decision for this to be a pure Kenjutsu battle. If he was better at Kenjutsu than Taijutsu, she wouldn't stand a chance. Fine, use whatever you want. She got at a ready stance and attacked him, creating three cage bunchons to help her. The four Yugaos attacked Naruto, who dodged them and quickly took care of the clones. Then he jumped towards Yugao and sent a downward hit, putting all of his weight to his hand. Yugao jumped back to avoid it, thinking that this was a rather amateur move compared to what he did until now. Unfortunately for her, things are not always as they seem. The moment Naruto's hand touched the ground, he did a handstand and started twirling his legs, forcing Yugao to jump back yet again. Naruto immediately used his hands to jump towards her, turned in the air and kicked her with his right leg. Yugao ducked under the kick, but Naruto turned in the air again and used his left leg to send a downwards attack, heel first. Yugao jumped back again, but as soon as Naruto's leg touched the ground, he shifted his weight from the heel to the toes and shot forward, his right leg not even touching the ground. Yugao had never before seen such a style. Naruto was always in motion, jumping and twirling, and sending hits with crazy speed. His movement was so fluid, that all his attacks looked like they were one move. Yugao was forced completely on the defensive, retreating all the time. She understood that sooner or later she wouldn't have any more room to retreat. The only way out of this predicament was to break his rhythm, and for that she needed to attack. She found her chance when he was about to do another handstand, with his left hand on the ground. She used as much chakra as she could to speed up her movements and slashed at him at his left side. Naruto however simply used his right hand to catch the blade. He had such perfect timing, that he wasn't even cut. Then he kicked Yugao to the chest, sending her backwards and forcing her to let go of the sword. She crashed on a tree. For the first time, Naruto stopped his unrelenting attack. Instead he twirled the katana around, testing its balance. He stopped, holding it in a reverse grip, and turned to Yugo, who had gotten back up. This is a fine blade, kept in perfect condition. And the timing of your attack was also perfect. It seems that I was wrong. You are worthy of holding it. With these words, he threw it to Yugo, who caught it and brought it to the left side of her head, holding it with both hands, the inner side down. Before she could move however, Naruto disappeared from her line of sight. He reappeared within her guard, crouching left of her. Fast, was all that Yugao had the time to think before she was hit to the gut by a punch that made blood come out of her mouth and her go through the tree that was behind her and crash to the one behind it. She lost consciousness. All the observers had their mouths open from the surprise, again. Then Sarutobi chuckled. It seems that Naruto was holding back his speed after all. Meanwhile, Kakashi had a sense deja vu. This reminded him of the day he used Chidori for the first time. Flashback. Kakashi was rushing towards the lone Iwa shinobi, intent on killing him and proving to his sensei that his technique was complete. Suddenly, he felt something cutting at his side, and his eyes widened when he realized that his sensei was right, that because of his speed he missed the katana that was ready to kill him. Suddenly, he was lifted from the ground and the enemy was kicked away from his sensei who had appeared out of nowhere doing a handstand, with such speed that none could follow. Flashback ends. His speed just now, it was like Sensei's. 
I've never before seen anyone besides him moving so fast, he thought shocked. Seeing his shocked face, Sarutobi chuckled again. It seems he is indeed the son of the yellow flash, E-H-H, Kakashi. Kakashi simply nodded, unable to form any words. Naruto picked up Yugao and moved her out of the way. Naruto's semi-last opponent approached him. I'm Uchiha Makoto. Originally, I wasn't planning to use the Sharingan, but seeing your speed, I'm afraid I don't have another choice. Don't worry, I promise I won't copy anything you'll use. Naruto nodded in acceptance. Makoto activated her Sharingan, and just in time, because Naruto had disappeared from where he was standing and appeared behind and right of her, on the air. He sent a kick to Makoto, who used both hands to block it. She still was forced a few feet back. Note to self. Dodge his attacks, not block them. That kick almost broke my hands, thought Makoto. And so she did. With her Sharingan, she was able to avoid his next attacks, but she wasn't fast enough to get a hit on him either. Eventually, both of them jumped back. Well, it seems we're in an impasse, said Makoto. Naruto nodded. So it would seem. So I guess I have to do something about it. With that, he extended his claws, which were promptly enveloped in wind chakra. Makoto gulped seeing this. Now she couldn't either dodge or block. This was bad. She threw some kanai at him and then formed a few hand signs. With a cage kanai jutsu, each kanai became 30, forcing Naruto to jump up to avoid them. Makoto, knowing this would happen, was already finishing her next set of hand signs. Kaden. Fire Dragon Jutsu. A fire dragon started heading towards the still airborne Naruto. Oh, shit, this is bad. Then he saw the nearby river and started forming hand signs. Sweden. Water Wall Jutsu. The water wall formed around him just in time to block the fire dragon, the meeting of fire and water creating a cloud of steam. Naruto flashed through a few hand signs and with a futon. Great breakthrough jutsu, send the steam to envelop Makoto, who cursed. Not only her Sharingan were blocked, Naruto didn't need sight to find her. Before she could get out of there however, she felt an attack headed for her. She moved to avoid it, which resulted in Naruto's punch narrowly missing her face. Still, because of the wind chakra her cheek was cut a little. Before she could move again, Naruto followed through with a knee in the gut, which made her double over. Then she felt a hit at the back of her neck and her world went black. Seeing Naruto carrying Makoto out of the cloud of steam, Kakashi sighed, knowing that he was the last one. Okay, Naruto, since I know better to engage you in taijutsu by now, this will be purely ninjutsu. Show me what you've got. Naruto nodded and waited for Kakashi to begin. Kakashi however didn't. Fighting someone who was almost the exact carbon copy of his sensei was unnerving. Then he saw Naruto doing a come hither motion with his right hand, just as Minato would do during their training spars. They looked so much alike, that as Naruto did this Kakashi saw an image of Minato being superimposed over Naruto. Naruto, getting bored with Kakashi's inactivity, unsealed three kanai in each hand, which he threw at Kakashi, before following Makoto's example and using the cage kanai jutsu to multiply them. The only difference was that instead of each kanai becoming 30, each one became 70. Naruto immediately used the great breakthrough jutsu, increasing the speed of the kanai 20-fold, forcing Kakashi to Kawamiri out of the way to avoid being torn to shreds. Since Kakashi knew that if he used the grand fireball jutsu it would be turned against him, he decided to use a Sweden jutsu. Sweden. Water Dragon Jutsu. Seeing the water dragon coming his way, Naruto went through a few hand signs and then slammed them to the ground, creating another earth wall to block it. He immediately used another Doden Jutsu. Doden. Rock Barrage. The earth wall was shattered and the pieces shot with great speed towards Kakashi, who was forced to Kawamiri out of the way again. Then he heard Naruto shouting, Futon. Wind Dragon Jutsu. Seeing the wind dragon coming his way, Kakashi cursed and started to run away trying to think what to do. The best solution was a fire dragon, but the dragon jutsus needed a lot of chakra and Kakashi's affinities were lighting, earth and water, not fire. He tried to create an earth wall to block it, but the dragon simply went around it, making Kakashi's eyes widen. Such control over a dragon jutsu meant that the user had both perfect chakra control and a very strong affinity for the element in question. 
Seeing no other way, Kakashi created the fire dragon. When the two dragons met, the wind dragon was absorbed by the fire dragon, making him stronger and faster. Using quite a lot of chakra, Kakashi steered the dragon towards Naruto. Seeing the dragon coming his way, Naruto immediately started forming hand signs, stopping at the semi-last one. As soon as the dragon came close, he did the last one, completing his jutsu. Futon. Void shield. The dragon started to disappear as it was about to hit Naruto, as if sucked by something. What was that? asked Kakashi, shocked that he stopped an enhanced fire dragon with a wind jutsu. Naruto smiled. That, Kakashi, was a defensive jutsu I made, designed specifically to defend against fire jutsus. It makes an area in front of me completely devoid of all air. And as you know, fire needs air to exist. And no you can't learn it. It requires a very strong wind affinity. Like all my jutsus, as he was talking, Naruto was forming more hand signs. You have made more, asked Kakashi, ready to defend against whatever Naruto would send to him. Yeah, I have. This one for example. He finished the hand signs and extended his arms forward, shouting, Futon. Wind blades barrage, ten wind blades left his hands and shot with great speed towards Kakashi, forming an intricate pattern that would be impossible to avoid. Kakashi had no choice but to use, once again, Kawamiri. Damn it, I need to end this fast. Making two dragons and altering the direction of one of them was taxing. He stood in front of Naruto, though a fair distance away from him, and formed three hand signs, before bracing his right hand with his left one. Lighting chakra started to dance around his hand. He turned to Naruto. Wind is a strong element, Naruto. But it doesn't have any defensive jutsu. It's used only for attacking. That's why you will lose. Naruto studied Kakashi's jutsu before answering. This is a strong looking jutsu there Kakashi. You are right. Lighting is the strongest attack element after wind, concentrating on piercing the opponent instead of cutting him. Plus, it's strong against earth, the main defensive element, so it's difficult to block these attacks. However, I can see a glaring weakness in your technique. Since the lighting is gathered around your hand, it's obviously a close ranged attack. However, since lighting attacks pierce, a close ranged attack would need a considerable speed behind it, and would probably be a straight thrust, for maximum performance. However, straight movement in such speed has two drawbacks. One, it will cause tunnel vision, making you blind to what's happening around you, making it easy to catch you off guard. And two, it will be very difficult to stop the attack once you begin it, if there is a reason to do so. I'm sorry Kakashi-san, but unless there is something I cannot see, this jutsu of yours is incomplete. Kakashi's eyes widened, and then he chuckled. You are truly your father's son. He told me the exact same things when he saw this technique for the first time. However, while he was right, you are wrong, for there is indeed something you cannot see. With these words, he uncovered his left eye, revealing a three tomo Sharingan. Ah, I see, Sharingan. Then you're right. Your technique is indeed complete. However, that doesn't mean I lost. You still haven't hit me. With these words, Naruto started to form hand signs. Determined not to let him finish his jutsu, Kakashi rushed forward, intent on finishing this fight. Hey, Kakashi, what's the name of that move? Asked Naruto, still forming hand signs. It's R-A-I-K-I-R-I. -I -I. By the time Kakashi finished his words he had already covered half the distance between them. However, then he saw Naruto smirk. Kakashi didn't like that, and for good reason. Suddenly, Naruto's hands started to move a lot faster, so fast that even Kakashi's Sharingan was seeing afterimages of them as they were forming hand signs. Kakashi, determined not to lose, pushed more chakra to his legs, increasing his speed. He noticed that the wind was suddenly blowing with more force, and he was sure that Naruto's jutsu had something to do with it. He pushed even more chakra to his legs, becoming faster than Guy without his weights. He wasn't fast enough. Naruto formed the last hand sign and shouted, Futon! Hurricane Wall Jutsu! Suddenly, wind started to twirl around Naruto with so much force, that it seemed literally like a hurricane. While Kakashi was surprised by seeing a defensive wind jutsu, he wasn't Konoha's best jonin for nothing. His mind analyzed the situation in fractions of a second. 
If he tried to stop now, he would crush on the wind wall because of his momentum, which probably meant that he would be cut to ribbons, if he judged from how fast the wind seemed to move. If he tried to use his rakiri, he would probably lose his hand, since wind had advantage over lighting. So he had only one option. He jumped above it, missing the chance to attack Naruto, but avoiding being seriously injured. That is, until Naruto made one more hand sign and said, release. Immediately, the wind forming the wall exploded towards all directions, cutting everything in its path. Kakashi was no exception, he fell to the ground, his body filled with dozens of cuts. The last thing he saw, before his vision darkened, was Naruto's back, the image of Minato once again superimposed over him. Sensei, after all these years, I still see only your back. I, can't catch up with you. Some time later, Kakashi came back to consciousness. He looked around him and saw he was in the hospital. He also saw Naruto sitting in a chair, reading a scroll. He was also wearing a headband with red cloth. Surprisingly, Kakashi couldn't feel any injuries. Hey! Naruto looked up at hearing Kakashi's voice. I see you woke up. How are you feeling? Surprisingly well. How long was I out? Asked Kakashi. Only one hour. You should be glad I underpowered the hurricane wall. Otherwise, you would either wake up in a week, or never. Most of you injuries were shallow cuts. Answered Naruto. That was underpowered. Anyway, what are you doing here? And what are you reading? Asked Kakashi, curious. This is the scroll my father left me. As for why I'm here, I want to talk with you, answered Naruto. About what? When we were fighting, you were not fighting me. In your head I mean. You were fighting my father. Why? Kakashi was about to deny it, but before he could he realized that Naruto was right. He shrugged. I'm not sure. You look and behave a lot like him. I guess it was because every student wants to surpass the teacher. It's a desire that never really fades. Naruto studied Kakashi for a while, before passing him a letter. What's this? Asked Kakashi. It's a letter my father left me. It mentions you. Read it. Answered Naruto. Curious, Kakashi started to read. Dear Naruto, if you are reading this letter, then either you know about Kayubi being inside you and found out about your parentage, or you know about Kayubi and are a Jonin. These were the conditions under which Sarutobi was to give you the scroll. Anyway, I suppose I should stop rambling. The reason I'm writing this letter is to beg for your forgiveness for sealing the Kayubi inside you. As you probably have guessed by now, I'm Minato Namikaze, the Yondaimi Hokage. And as you may know, I'm your father. I'm terribly sorry for choosing you, but I couldn't ask from someone else to sacrifice what I couldn't. I'm the Hokage and it's my duty. Even as I'm writing this letter, I, my sensei and Serutobi are looking for another way to stop the fox, but I know that there is no such way. At least you will have your mother, my beloved Kashina, to take care of you. If you don't hate me, as you would have every right to do, I would like you to do two things for me. 1. Find that perverted godfather of yours, Jiraiya of the Sanim, and kick him on the nuts. That will teach him to peep on my Kashina. And 2. See if you can persuade my former student Hitaki Kakashi to stop living in the past and mourning about those he lost. He is too good a person and shinobi to be left in such a fate. I love you son, and no matter what you do, I'll always be proud of you. Your father, Minato Namikaze. P.S. If you have seen the rest of the scroll, you will probably be calling me every name in the book by now for not leaving detailed descriptions for my jutsu, and only hints on them. Sorry but I want only those worthy of them to use them. I'm sure you'll be able to figure them out son. Kakashi wiped a tear from his eye and promised himself to stop living in the past. He returned the letter to Naruto. Thanks Naruto. You know, about you mother, it's not that she didn't love you, she. I know, Serutobi told me. Interrupted Naruto. Now listen to me carefully Kakashi. I know where you're coming from because just like every student wants to surpass the teacher, so does every son wants to surpass the father. However, in our case, this is not possible. We can't reach him, said Naruto slowly. But, began Kakashi, he was interrupted again, there is no point Kakashi. No man can reach him, let alone pass him. There is no one that can outrun the thunder. Not even the gods. They can keep up with it, 
but not outrun it. But, if you manage to figure out the Horishin, tried Kakashi again, but Naruto simply laughed. If I do, I admit that I'll get closer to him. But I won't reach him. Kakashi, right now, I can't even understand the hints he left for it. I might have been able to come up with the Rasengan on my own. But Horishin, never. Kakashi, I read every book on seals in his, or rather, my house, and I still can't even figure out what the hints about the Horishin mean. I'll need a lot of experience in making seals to do it, and then I'll need more time to recreate it. The title seal master doesn't do him justice Kakashi. He was more like a seal god. Now, I suggest you get moving. Serutobi wants you to his office. I need to go to the academy for the teams. Oh, and I heard some rumors that you were always two to three hours late for everything. I wonder who goes around and spreads such obvious lies. See you, Kakashi. With these words, Naruto left. Kakashi got ready to go to the Hokage's office, while noting to himself to never be late when he has to meet Naruto. He didn't miss the underlying threat in Naruto's last words. A few minutes later, when Kakashi entered the Hokage's office, he found there all those who knew about Naruto. Seeing him, Serutobi spoke. All right everyone, since we are all here, listen carefully. It's about Naruto's rank. I've already told him. Now, officially, he will be a normal genin, at least until the next chunin exams. Unofficially however, he will take Orochimaru's place as the third sanin. He is the wolf sanin. Whenever he is on a mission where myself or one of the older and more experienced sanin, Jiraiya and Tsunade, aren't present, he will have command over all shinobi. You will obey him. You are not to reveal this to you genin, unless you deem that the situation absolutely demands it in which case you will have to support your decision to me afterwards, or unless Naruto himself tells you that you can reveal it. This is an S-class secret. Objections. Hiyashi answered, Hokage-sama, I don't doubt his ability, but are you sure he has the necessary experience? Serutobi decided to answer, since this was an honest worry, not born out of spite. He will go on many A and s rank missions to build up experience. He himself admits that he doesn't have nearly enough experience as most people in this room, let alone the other two Sani. Don't forget however that he has inside him a being with more experience than all of us put together. Any other questions? Nobody had any more questions, so Serutobi proceeded to tell them about the teams. Meanwhile, Naruto went to the academy, though not before sending Nawaki to the forest to check on the pack. When he entered the classroom, he simply gave to the teacher a man with a scar going over the bridge of his nose the letter given to him by the Hokage and then went to the back of the classroom to sit, ignoring the looks sent to him by the children. He removed the sword from his back, rested it against the wall next to the seat he chose, he sat down, put both of his feet on the desk, and then lied back and closed his eyes, trying to relax. While he was doing these, everyone in the room was trying to understand what just happened and who was this guy. The teacher, who went by the name Aruka, coughed to get their attention. All right everyone, this is Konoha's new genin, cleared by Hokage-sama himself. According to this, he just arrived in Konoha. Care to introduce yourself? Without opening his eyes, Naruto answered, name's Naruto. Now just do your job and announce the teams. I've got work to do. Most students in there were surprised that he would talk in such a way to a teacher. One of them however decided that he didn't like the newcomer's attitude, but held back because the teachers were still in the room. Uruka coughed again and started announcing the teams. Okay, listen up everyone, team 1 is, team 7 is Sasuke Uchiha, Sakura Haruno and Naruto N, he was stopped by a kanai impacting the wall next to his head. Did I say you could tell my last name? If I want anyone to know, I'll tell it myself, said Naruto. Some of the students of the room would have said something about this, if it wasn't for the fact that he still hasn't opened his eyes. They've never seen anyone doing this before. Uruka coughed for a third time, inwardly deciding that next time he would use his patented demon head jutsu. Okay Naruto, but it's not nice to throw kanai to people because of that. Anyway, Team 7 sensei is Kakashi Hitaki. Team 8 is Shino Aburame, Kiba Inazuka and Hinata Hayuga. Their sensei is Kuranai Yuhi. He ignored the muttered, lucky bastards, he heard from Naruto, 
even if inwardly he agreed and wondered how Naruto knew her, and continued. It was really a testament to the Chunin's ears, considering that the students, who were closer to Naruto, didn't hear him. Team 9 is still in circulation. Team 10 is Shikamaru Nara, Choji Akamichi and Ino Yamanaka. Your sensei is Asuma Serutobi. Once again he ignored Naruto when he muttered, they made this lazy ass sensei, but once again he wondered how Naruto knew the man, even if he again agreed with Naruto. He told the students to stay there and wait for their senseis and then he left, heading to the Hokage's office to ask him why the letter was telling him not to disagree in anything with Naruto. Back in the classroom, the aforementioned student decided that now was a good time to deal with Naruto. Just who the hell do you think you are, barging in here and acting all cool? I bet you are nothing more than a common loser. Naruto knew the one talking was the Inazuka, both from his smell and from the fact that he could hear his companion telling him to leave him alone. But the idiot probably wasn't advanced or capable enough to understand him. Hey, Inazuka, I suggest you listen to your companion and stop before you dig an even bigger grave for yourself. Then Naruto extended his hand and caught the hand of an idiot who was about to take his sword. Don't, touch, my, sword, he threw the idiot to the opposite wall. He still hadn't opened his eyes. A few seconds before that happened, the Jonin were about to enter the classroom, even though they were still surprised that Kakashi was on time. They understood it however when he told them what happened at the hospital. When they opened the door however, the saw a male student impacting the wall left of them. They also saw the Uchiha approaching Naruto. They exchanged looks and decided to wait and watch the fireworks, since nobody had seen them yet, being too obsessed with what was happening. Naruto smelled the Jonin and got up to greet them, his height making the nearby Jonin unconsciously take a few steps back. Before he could however, the Uchiha approached him. Hey, you loser, fight me. Naruto tilted his head to the side. Are you talking to me? Of course I'm talking to you. Dobi, replied the Uchiha, full of arrogance. Naruto shrugged, sure. The Uchiha smirked and got in a ready stance, but before he could move or say anything, Naruto backhanded him and sent him towards the Jonin, who got out of the way and let him hit the wall outside the classroom. Now, a word of advice, Inazuka. I suggest you keep your hormones in check when you're with your sensei. I don't think that you would like to get in even more trouble at your home. Anyway. Where to, Kakashi? said Naruto. Kakashi I smiled at him. To the roof Naruto, we will join you shortly. Naruto nodded and left with a gust of wind. The students looked each other surprised, not only with Naruto's behavior, but also with the fact that since he entered the classroom, he hadn't opened his eyes once. Kakashi moved towards the Uchiha, who was just coming to. It's not nice to antagonize your teammates, Uchiha Sasuke. Anyway, in case you didn't hear it, come to the roof, now. With that, he disappeared with a puff of smoke. When Sasuke and Sakura got to the roof, they saw their sensei reading an orange book and Naruto relaxing with his eyes closed again, enjoying the sun. Seeing them, Kakashi closed him book and called them to get over there. When they sat down, Kakashi told them to introduce themselves. You know, likes, dislikes, hobbies, dreams. Why don't you start sensei? so that we know what to do. Proposed the pink-haired monstrosity. Idiot, thought Kakashi, as did Naruto, but he answered anyway. Well, my name is Kakashi Hitaki. You are too young to know about my likes. You have no business knowing my dream. And I have a few hobbies. While Sasuke and Sakura were fuming over the fact that they learned only his name, Naruto wanted to burst laughing at their reactions. He had Kayubi put a minor genjutsu over his eyes, making them appear blue, so that he wouldn't have to deal with annoying questions about his eyes. Okay, you next Pinky, said Kakashi. Sakura bristled at her nickname, but answered anyway. I like, insert look at Sasuke and squeal. My hobbies are, inset look at Sasuke and squeal. My dream is, insert look at Sasuke, squeal and blush. I dislike Ino Pig and Naruto, she screeched the last part making everyone hold their ears and Kakashi and Naruto to think, just what I needed, a banshee fangirl pretending to be shinobi. Okay, you next, duck head, said Kakashi, pointing at Sasuke. Sasuke ignored the nickname and answered, I don't have any likes and I have many dislikes. Hobbies are useless. 
My dream? No, my ambition is to kill my brother and restore my clan. Great, an avenger. It seems that Hokage-sama was right about him, thought Kakashi. Naruto meanwhile was shaking his head at his teammate's stupidity. Kakashi turned to Naruto. Okay, you last. Having interpreted Naruto's look correctly, Kakashi didn't add any nickname this time. Naruto pretended to think about it. Well, if I have to, my name is Naruto Namikaze. You don't need to know anything else. Yes, I'm the Yandaimi's son, no I won't answer any questions. Now beat it before I throw you down. He added a little key to his words to make sure they would listen to him. You could wait for me to tell them about the test, said Kakashi annoyed. Naruto just shrugged, just hunt the Uchiha down. The Banshee will be nearby. Hum, since I didn't let you be late today, you can be extra late tomorrow. Tell them to go at 6, and we will arrive at 10. Seems good. Sure, what are you going to do now? Asked Kakashi. Well, first I'm going to have some fun with the Inazuka. I really want to see what his mother and sister will react when they hear that he called me names. The idiot will probably do it again. Then I have to find her. Answered Naruto. Before Kakashi could ask who Naruto meant, he vanished with a wind shunshun. Kakashi sighed, summoned Pakun and told them to get a message to the hospital saying that they should expect Inazuka Kiba who would have at least 10 cuts, 3 broken bones and mild concussion, and then left to find the Avenger and the Banshee and have fun with their faces when he told them they're not Genin yet. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.